Hello everyone, welcome back for some more business ethics. Um, we're going to be starting off a new unit. Um, my apologies again about um, losing out on a day last week, but I was feeling terrible and just not in a position to do it. And actually my sickness has hung on until uh, as of this morning um, on Monday. So uh, yeah, it was the right call and I'm sorry for throwing off the schedule a little bit, but probably made your weekend a little easier if you'd already done the Velasquez and Warhane readings um, for last week, then you got to really enjoy the three-day weekend. So maybe that was all uh, worked out for the best anyway. But um, we're going to get started with this new unit on international business. And I'm really excited about this one. I This is another one of my favorite topics. I mean, all, there's a, so many topics to choose from in the world of business ethics that pretty much if it's on the reading list for our class, I think it's an important discussion and something worth talking about. Um, but this one is definitely one that I um, I care about a lot personally as an ethicist um, because really the question of international business as we're going to be exploring it is going to be a question of um, moral relativism in many ways. Um, we it was moral relativism was something we discussed at the very beginning of the quarter and I've been promising for a long time that we were going to kind of return to it and take a look at it again and that's what this unit is all about. Um, it's in the kind of context of intercultural interactions and um, relationships that the issue about moral relativism, I think, really comes to a head and becomes um, uh, very relevant and important in a practical sort of way. So it's, it's sort of like e even if we um, weren't thinking about the space of international business or multinational corporations or something like that, we could still talk about moral relativism, and we should. I mean, it's an important um, issue in how we think about moral truth generally. But <clears throat> as often happens, there are certain um, moral problems that become a little more pressing when your personal circumstances sort of align with it. I might have told this story before about um, there was a, in the you know the opioid epidemic that's been kind of going on, which has really been going on for a long time, and only recently is it sort of taken on national interest, um, but it, it, it's been a problem for a long time. Um, but in that debate, there was um, there was some call for, I can't remember which neighborhood, it was one of the surrounding suburbs of Seattle that they wanted to put a methadone clinic in. And there was a lot of local opposition to that um, because people have a lot of views about what it means to have a methadone clinic and that they're going to have heroin addicts and homeless more homeless people or more risk of crime like all these sorts of um, uh, fears uh, motivated the political discussion but there was this one guy who was kind of like the main person who was heading up that political resistance to city hall in opening up the methadone clinic and then he finds out that his son is addicted to heroin um, and as he sort of tried to address that and dealt with it uh, he completely changes his mind on the appropriateness of the methadone clinic. And in some ways you might just say, oh, well, it's just biased because of his personal circumstances that it's his family now that's at risk. Um, but in other ways you could say this isn't bias as much as experience opening up a sensitivity to something that really is there that it's easy to ignore or downplay until you really have a relationship with it and see it directly. Um, and actually, uh, I, hmm. Yeah, I think I'm going to do this. <laughs> I was trying to debate whether I wanted to bring this up or not. Um, but I've been uh, trying to catch up on grading and um, stuff this weekend, and I still have a lot more to do. Um, and I want I want to be more caught up than I am right now. But I've been reading a lot of your journals and reading comments on the Affirmative Action Unit. And I thought a lot of the responses, um, I'll be honest, I, I pretty much, um, well, in many cases, strongly disagreed with. Um, but some of this, I was, I, I, I'm, I'm always open. I mean, I'm not right about everything. Um, and I, I've mentioned in a lot of comments and feedback to people that I'd love to talk about this more with you. Um, so if you're one of those people I'm disagreeing with, um, I'm not throwing you under the bus. I just would love to have a conversation about it. But I, I think it's kind of similar here because um, I, I saw that a lot of the responses are maybe downplaying the significance of the inequality that exists in our society. And I think when you talk to people who experience it directly, who are in some of these disenfranchised demographics, 
um, especially if they are not shielded from some of these effects by living in a more upper class uh, part of sector of society that you um, you might have some other things on your radar in terms of the sen the moral sensitivities of what's going on here and not just out of sympathy for people without thinking about it in more principled ways but to understand the realities that people really are still faced with and what might justify taking um, a more aggressive response rather than just waiting things out like you see with strong affirmative action um, so I definitely don't think we're out of the woods on inequality and um, and I think to say that uh, this is that we we don't need to take a route like this that it, it isn't justified in comparison with things like efficiency or meritocracy may not take the problem as seriously as it actually is um, but anyway, I'm not going to talk a ton more about affirmative action or my opinions here because I do want to get into this stuff about in, in international business. But um, I would very much love to carry on some of those conversations with some of you. Um, many times I've been throwing out little messages about like, hey, I'd love to talk more about this. Um, but uh, not a ton of them have uh, materialized, but the invitation is always open and I don't get sick of making those invitations no matter how many times they don't happen. But I also definitely wanted to kind of generally advertise that um, if my feedback, like I said this at the beginning of the quarter, you're always free to tell me like, no thanks on the feedback, Tim. Um, and if you don't like me butting in and offering my two cents on all the stuff that you're writing or thinking about, um, I'm happy to not do that. So let me know if, if you don't want me to do that. But um, I like to have conversation, strike up conversation, and uh, as maybe is coming through about philosophy this quarter already, um, a lot of that happens through the space of disagreement, and that's where all the action happens. So, um, so yeah, that invitation is always out there. Okay, so in this issue about um, international business, the the real question is about. So if you've got these multinational corporations, you've got a company that's operating in a number of different societies that all have their different cultures. And a big part of culture is moral values and what ought to happen and uh, codes of conduct, uh, social expectations for appropriate behavior, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and the rationales behind them, the, the moral ideals, the conceptions of justice. Um, when those are different, how is the company supposed to respond to that? Um, which way should they adjudicate that disagreement? So cross-cultural moral disagreement is really the where the um, and ethical ethical questions around international business really get their teeth from that issue right there. Um, so let's let's get started with Velasquez. I actually I'll be I'll kind of throw my two cents out here. I I don't agree with Velasquez's conclusions. I think that Velasquez is a little fatalistic about this more than I think is is necessary. Um, that's my kind of take on this debate. I, so Velasquez is one of my opponents. But I really like the way that Velasquez sets everything up. And that's why this is the first paper that we're reading on this unit. Um, I think he does a fantastic job of helping us uh, see what's at issue here and what is the debate about. So what Velasquez is going to argue is that um, in dealing with this problem of cross-cultural ethical disagreement, uh, contemporary moral theory that we have from business ethicists and moral philosophers generally uh, utterly fails to um, address this question with an acceptable answer. So we'll have to look at what Velasquez has in mind with that. I mean, what he is going to do is kind of look at a bunch of the options. Um, and then try to problematize them to say how any of the answers that we've got so far are inadequate for one reason or another. Um, and the two main the two main approaches are going to be either straight up moral relativism, which is an option, or some kind of moral absolutism. When we get, I think we'll we'll be able to have some time here tonight to get into Werhein as well. Warhain's going to also kind of problematize our um, traditional moral theories, but in a very particular sort of way. Um, but it's also going to kind of be talking about that tension between those two types of responses. Um, and then Arnold is going to have a much more positive picture to offer in response to these challenges that we'll, we'll do later on this week. So um, I, uh, I, I like this kind of setup. I like 
looking at the problem first before jumping to an answer or a solution. And I think that's another kind of good lesson to take away for the papers that you're working on um, and why I've been encouraging you to focus around a controversy. Let the focus of your paper come from the issue that you want to discuss rather than necessarily your answer. Like you will be defending a thesis, um, and I want you to be defending a thesis, and the whole paper is about that. Um, but you'll gain a lot of direction and guidance, I think, in working on that, um, on how to do that defense and what to think about from your opponents if you keep the controversy clearly identified as kind of a shining beacon throughout all of that. The controversy is what motivates the need for your thesis, um, and that can really help with brainstorming and just when you're actually getting down to composing the paper, um, getting some direction on it, and maybe some ideas about how to organize it as well. But, but not downplaying a problem and not minimizing a problem, but looking at it in its kind of full-fledged scariness uh, and intimidation factor uh, is, is always good for a healthy answer and a healthy response. Or I guess maybe I could say a more robust answer, a more robust response, something that really settles it um, rather than just sort of eh, dismisses it as like not something worth caring about too much. Um, yeah, so that's advice. Also on the paper pr front, just as a friendly reminder, we've got less than two weeks out uh, to when it's due. The, the paper needs to be turned in on the 8th of June, and that's really a hard deadline. Um, because we need to turn around those papers anonymously and give you chance to do the response paper um, in the following week before the quarter is over. So um, the 15th is the absolute last day in which I can accept work and uh, get your grade turned in on time. I have until the following Monday, so I just have three days to turn around grades from Friday, from the 15th. So getting the paper in by the 8th is really, really important. Um, if you think that can't happen, we should talk about that as soon as possible if you're thinking that's not going to happen. So I strongly recommend avoiding procrastinating on this and getting yourself into trouble there. Um, in fact, um, to kind of motivate this, um, I don't usually like to do this, but because the timing is so important, there will be a grade penalty if for some reason you don't turn it in to me on time. Um, by the 8th. Uh, that will be that'll be pretty crucial. As a respect for your peers, um, and allowing them to have time to be able to get uh, their the response paper done in a comfortable amount of time too. I thought a week for that would be appropriate, so we've got two weeks left here on the paper. So my recommendation is um, do try to. I've kind of said this stuff before when we when we had the paper lecture day, um, but I think now that we've got that, uh, I'm putting the time back up. If you could have most of the ideas worked out for your paper by the end of this week and then give yourself a week to compose the paper and edit it so to like actually write up a draft and then start working on it and editing it to make it better um, in the final week I think that would be the best call so um, if you can have maybe an outline um, definitely some all of the things you're planning on talking about worked out in your head and your um, sources already uh, collected um, by the first, that would be my advice. And then you'll have a nice comfortable week to actually compose the paper and edit it. And editing is really important for a philosophy paper if it's going to be at all quality. Barfing it out the night before doesn't usually work very well as I mentioned before. Um, so that that's my advice uh, in terms of pacing for this. And if you want to get it in earlier than that, I got no problems with that either. That's totally cool. Okay, so let, let's get back to Velasquez, though. Sorry for the tangent. So Velasquez kind of helps to motivate the need for us to think about this space of um, international business, also because of globalization, that there's been this sort of um, momentum toward the world getting smaller and smaller, and that companies um, are... Mm, less encouraged anymore to just stick within um, a domestic setting. For certain market niches, this is totally fine. There's not a lot of pressure. Um, certainly for smaller businesses, it's not as important to go international. But the economy of the world, of individual countries in the world, is increasingly getting more and more wrapped up with other ones. And I think a really good historical example of this is the 2008 recession 
um, the housing market collapse, the bank by a uh, bank bailout that had to happen, um, or maybe it <laughs> depends on your opinions about what was the proper response. But that situation, the hit that the American economy took, um, led to problems across the planet for other economies too. That when our economy started to fail, other countries, their economies also were in deep trouble in some cases, especially some cases, some places in Europe, really got hit hard as sort of a aftershock, like an earthquake kind of thing. Um, because our economies are, are tied up with each other increasingly more and more. So there are issues that, have, that come from this. Um, one of them, and, and this is a distinction I'm bringing in, this is not in Velasquez, but I, I think it's worth it. I, I think Velasquez does a good job not running on the wrong side of this distinction, um, but I think it's worth talking about. And that's I, I, so this is the distinction I'm talking about here is that this problem of coordinating a multinational corporation has two levels to it. One level is really just a management issue. So if you're a U.S. company that's going to be working in India, or that's going to be working in France or anywhere. Um, what are you going to do about the fact that that society and the people in that co in that country in that community um, don't have the same expectations? They don't have the same values as uh, always as what happens in America. Sometimes they do, but there's other ways in which they might not. And how is the company going to deal with that? How are they going to be responsive to that situation? If you want to hire people, like if you want to set up a branch of your company in that country, how are you going to deal with managing those people and then coordinating what's going on with their efforts with the efforts of your other employees, uh, which are in other branches or that are from different cultures? Or that maybe come from the culture that is running the whole show, right? The, the kind of... The, if this is like a U.S. corporation, it's going to be run by Americans. Um, how <clears throat> there's going to be some issues there. Now that's just a management issue. I mean, even if you were completely amoral, you'd have to deal with that problem in some way, or at the peril of your business not being a viable one, or having complications that hurt efficiency um, and and lower your profitability. Um, that's definitely going to be a management problem, no matter what. Um, but that's a very different sort of set of considerations from the second level, which is about ethical, an ethical concern about this. Is there anything about these ethical disagreements that should get us to rethink what we would think to be proper ethical business practice? Is the fact that these cultures have values that are different from, from what we might intuitively consider as honest business dealings, um, should that um, spark any kind of ethical conversation or get us to maybe adjust our ethical standards from what we normally would do if it was a purely domestic firm and we we're just operating the business just in America, um, for example. Velasquez focuses on the second one, and I think that's exactly right. I mean, that's the one that's really interesting. The, the management issue is going to be related to that, but... Um, this is a business ethics class, <laughs> not a business management class. Um, and whatever way we want to solve the management problems, we want to be looking at that through the lens of the ethical issues, um, of whether we're doing something proper. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of ways that you can make a buck off of people in another country that aren't going to be ethical, um, but that would solve the management issue, right? So that that's always not what we're interested in here. Um, we're, we, of course... Profit is a consideration, as we've talked about many, many times before, but it's not the only thing that we care about. Um, it's not the only measure of success um, when we're talking about the operation of a business, unless you have the most extreme, one of the most extreme ethical positions on this issue, that basically there are no ethical responsibilities of businesses whatsoever. And for reasons that we've talked about many times before, that's a very, very difficult position to maintain um, and seriously defend. So um, we're going to be focusing on that, that second issue about um, how we might have to change our, our notions of ethics at all. So actually, um, to give this a little bit of setting, I think one of the most interesting, um, there, there's so many things we could choose from here but for, as examples, but I think one of the really interesting ones that gets at this issue of 
how this isn't just a management issue but also is a an issue of ethics is the practice of bribery in many countries not I mean certain parts of the US at certain times in history it's been but in general in America uh, bribery is not the cost of doing business um, it's technically illegal so there's laws against it and does it happen yeah it's still somewhat it definitely bribery is not eliminated from American society and sometimes there's some pretty sketchy stuff going on. Uh, if you've been following the news recently, there's actually a bunch of instances of this kind of thing happening, especially related to political lobbying. Um, but I, I'm not going to open up that can of worms. But in other countries, bribery is not something that just happens secretly or in the shadows or something like that. <clears throat> but it's it's just um, – it may, it may not be explicitly talked about a whole lot, but it's definitely a universal expectation that if you want to get business done, you got to bribe the right people. So there's a there it's kind of just a way of moving things along, and in some cultures it's considered just the cost of doing business. So if a multinational corporation was going to exist in one of those countries, um, let's say a U.S. corporation was going to operate in one of those countries, should the corporation, um, you know, follow this practice of giving delivering bribes, um, or not? Um, there's a lot of different ways to respond to this. One way might say. <clears throat> Bribery is wrong, ethically wrong, universally, so it shouldn't be done. And if that hurts profits, so be it. That's the cost of having an ethical business. We're not going to make a buck on people in an exploitive sort of way, so we're not going to do it. I guess especially uh, a company might be resistant to bribery because they don't want to pay the money, um, but that there, there could be a kind of idealistic, a moral idealism here, uh, sort of acting on principle, to say, no, we're not going to engage in this dirty practice. Um, another response might be to say, well, maybe it's not so bad. Maybe that's just the way things happen. And it doesn't have, maybe it might look to us like this is something unethical. But within this society, within this economy, um, it doesn't seem to really be hurting people. It doesn't have some of the nasty or pernicious effects that we might worry about with bribery. Maybe, maybe, we're, maybe we're just a little too sensitive to it as a moral issue. Maybe we should see it's actually okay. So basically we should change our mind about that. Another response would say, no, bribery is wrong for us, but it is right for them. So when you're dealing with that country, bribery is cool, but in America, you shouldn't start giving out bribes. That wouldn't be appropriate. Um, that would be more like the moral relativism. The first two options were more of what um, Velasquez is going to talk about as uh, the absolutist kind of model. Um, but that last one's more like the moral relativism model. And that's the one we're going to look at first here. Okay. <clears throat> so um, we have talked about relativism before. Um, let me start with like a little brief recap of this. Um, so I was mentioning that uh, when we talked about this before that there's kind of a core philosophical principle that this debate around moral truth hangs on. And that's uh, – the biggest one is whether there is universal or objective moral truth or not. Relativism says that there isn't, but for a reason. The relativist believes that truth is something I said before as stance-dependent. That is, what is true depends on your way of looking. And what this basically boils down to – there's a ton of varieties of, of relativism out there, but a lot of them boil down to something like whatever you believe, that's your truth. And if we want to open it up, I think we also talked about this variation on relativism um, that isn't so individualistic, like individual people's perspectives is the truth for that individual person. We can talk about cultural relativism too. And it's really cultural relativism that Velasquez is entertaining the most here. Um, cultural relativism would say instead of it being the beliefs of an individual person that sets the truth for that person, instead it's the values and principles and sort of shared beliefs of a community uh, in a culture that defines the truth for them, for that group. Okay, so instead of it being individual by individual, we're going group by group now. Um, so th the um, the people who are going to say that there's um, universal objective moral truth, um, they might go stance independent. That was what we talked about before as moral realism. I also made it a little bit more complicated by talking about this position of of subjectivism, which also believes with relativism that truth is stance-dependent, that it depends on something about human subjectivity, 
but it still believed in objective universal truth. And I'm going to lump realism and subjectivism together because even if the, the subjectivist believes that moral truth somehow depends on our way of looking at things or something about human subjectivity, they definitely don't believe that it's just to be equated directly with um, people's beliefs and values. That whatever they believe, that's the truth for them. Um, subjectivist doesn't buy into that sort of thing. We did have two really famous subjectivists that we studied. Mill and Kant were both subjectivists, but they have pretty el uh, absolute theories, don't they? Um, they definitely are recommending a universal principle and a universal set of values for how we should make moral decisions. Um, so the big thing I think that's that's sort of um, defining of relativism, specifically cultural relativism, is that it really puts this one-to-one -one relationship between what's true for you and what you believe. And in this way, it's actually impossible um, for a culture to ever be wrong. They're always right. No matter what their beliefs and values are, that's the truth for them. And, and moral relativism can look um, kind of attractive, I think. And I, I think Velasquez does a good job of sort of framing this up. If you've got these sort of conflicts between different cultures and you start to despair about finding some kind of argument or reason why, you know, a judgment in one of them is preferable from the judgment to the other or is more correct or more true, if giving a rational defense, it seems like, oh, this is too big of a problem, relativism kind of gives you this out. It's like you don't have to resolve it. People just have different truths. Done. Problem solved. Um, Velasquez is going to argue that this doesn't really solve anything, and we'll see what he has to say about that. But I, I think that's a good way of putting what makes it attractive. It's kind of this old adage of when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Like you don't have to have any dig, big ethical questions or quagmires. You don't have to try to integrate all these different cultural perspectives into one big picture somehow. You just have to know how to switch gears. Um, and that's... Um, that's the kind of proposal that's on the table here. I, I've taught ethics for eh, almost a decade now, I've been teaching, and I have always had a lot of students who look at relativism with a lot of attractiveness, um, that it does seem to be a, a, a great way to solve problems, that it just uh, removes conflict. Um, I don't think it really does, and I think Velasquez does a good job of, of arguing for that. Um, and relativism has all sorts of other issues with it too. Um, but I, I don't think – I think in, in the worst-case scenario, and this is not the most charitable, but I definitely have seen evidence for this in talking with people, and not just students um, that I've taught, but people everywhere. Um, sometimes people are pretty old. Um, that sometimes relativism is just uh, attractive, I think, because it allows for intellectual laziness. It's like I don't have to actually deal with the problem. Like, it's not a problem. I, I refuse to recognize it as a problem. That's kind of what relativism ends up saying. Um, I've talked before um, about why relativism has a bunch of problems to it, um, specifically around uh, uh, cultures in particular. Um, I don't know if you remember my argument about how relativism might look attractive because it inspires an attitude about tolerance. Um, but maybe you remember my argument about how relativism actually doesn't promote tolerance and it actually undercuts the ability to argue on behalf of tolerance as an important moral value. If you had an intolerant society or culture, you couldn't say that they were wrong under, if moral relativism is true. So um, I think the value on tolerance is maybe one of the, the motivations for relativism that I'm more sympathetic with, that I think has a little bit more going for it, but I don't think relativism helps you there either. Um, Velasquez also doesn't um, want to really get into all the universal problems that relativism has. He's like, I've talked about this in other papers. The problems he's going to put on the table here are going to be specifically about how it doesn't solve any of these problems for international managers. Um, it doesn't solve the questions about international business at all. Um, so those are new arguments. Um, but all the general ones I do think are important to have in the back of your mind. One of the biggest reasons that we talked about before that um, is concerning about relativism is that, one, it might be self-defeating. It might defeat its own uh, thesis. <laughs> it's like uh, self uh, – uh, it's, it's in contradiction with itself. Um, and then secondly, um, 
that it the and this is one of the most basic reasons you could have it just doesn't allow you to be wrong and that seems implausible Velasquez will talk about that too okay so he also mentioned something else here that I think is is important um, he mentions that very very few philosophers actually defend relativism straight up and I think he's right about that um, the, the number of moral philosophers that I've met who are actual moral relativists and who defend that position seriously I can count on one hand um, there's probably more than that but in terms of ones that I've had any kind of personal contact with either conversation met them in person or have read their work in journal articles things like that um, or books or, or or part of a discussion a philosophical discussion very rare very rare but Velasco's is totally also right I think um, in terms of getting a sense of the field that there are all these new positions that while not being relativism straight up or using that term definitely have relativistic leanings uh, or relativistic tendencies and these are what he talks about as particularist theories so let's talk about a few of these I think they're they're interesting so he defines uh, particular theories here as uh, a theory that claims that ethical disputes should be settled by appealing to the actual moral traditions and practices of a particular social group so this kind of view um, and actually particularism gets used in a couple different ways in among moral philosophers but this is one of the readings for it um, there, there's some other ones too I'm maybe maybe I'll talk about eh, it's kind of there's a lot of potential tangents here I could go on so I need to be careful um, but this is this is one of the views and it's really making a, a more universal pronouncement because it's talking about what would be right um, about the right way to settle an ethical dispute so it's not saying that well whatever is right is just what people say is right it is making a, a stronger sort of stance but the content of that principle that it's offering is still saying let local customs traditions and practices of a group determine how to resolve ethical disputes with that group okay so in in sort of for all practical purposes we might say this will yield the same result as relativism would it's just maybe being theoretically um, wrapped up in a different package um, but it, it really ends up having a lot of the same results um, communitarians are really interesting um, in fact <clears throat> I'd say uh, communitarians are not that far away from another position that's pretty famous in America called contractarianism or contractualism or a couple terms for it there's actually a subtle difference between those two but I'm not gonna get into that uh, the, the idea here being that there really isn't any absolute morality except when people start making contracts with each other so think back to Hasnas Hasnas uh, this is way back the fiduciary duty debate Hasnas was really trying to emphasize to us that all of the ethical theories in the fiduciary duty debate all sort of talk about uh, consensual contracts as being something with moral authority and I think the kind of like extreme libertarian position that we might entertain uh, on issues of business ethics is also very sort of sympathetic to that view that um, that it's not quite the same thing as contract contractualism or contractarianism or communitarianism um, but there it wouldn't take much like Hasnas doesn't come out and say that but I, I suspect he's kind of motivated by it um, but the view is really to say there really aren't like we create the moral realm the the broader uh, family of theories that these theories fall under is something called constructivism which says that moral truth is something we construct now once we construct it then it has absolute binding uh, authority um, so it's not like you know do whatever um, but it does sort of have that do whatever before we make any contracts right once we agree to something though then we're bound by it so what uh, when Velasquez is talking about communitarians which he defines as saying that special traditions and culture can override otherwise universal moral obligations um, the most extreme version of that would be a contractarian which would say all those universal moral obligations the only obligations that exist are the ones that pertain to consensual agreements so if you never make any consensual agreements you're not actually subject to any obligations um, but once you do start making those agreements now you gotta respect them and society always involves these kinds of 
<clears throat> contracts or agreements or systems of cooperation. So morality is a big part of our lives, according to the contractarian. But notice how <clears throat> it again kind of comes down to the conventions of what do people agree with. And since different societies set up different systems of agreement, they're all subject to different patterns of moral responsibilities as a result. So again, you get something that for all practical purposes really ends up being a lot like relativism. And then finally, there's this virtue theory. And I, I say in my lecture notes here, uh, this isn't virtue ethics like Aristotle. Uh, I say it's its weirdo contemporary bastard child. Uh, and, and I'm saying that in an objective sense, not pejoratively. It's just a little joke. Um, I've sometimes thought about cutting this from my lecture notes, but I keep it in there for fun. Um, I don't know if you remember me talking about uh, this with virtue ethics, but I think I definitely brought it up. Aristotle's virtue ethics looks pretty different from a lot of contemporary theories of virtue ethics. A lot of the contemporary ones um, talk about uh, virtue ethics in terms of emulating a role model. Like, so find someone who is a uh, an example of a virtuous person and then mimic them, mimic their qualities, try to take on their personality. So if you find someone who's morally in inspirational, um, then the way you should act is to follow what they would do. Um, so it's kind of mimicry or role model sort of way of approaching virtue um, to try to have the characteristics of a virtuous person. Um, that is uh, how contemporary virtue ethics goes. Now Aristotle didn't really do that, right? because he was giving us a much more robust theory of how you define what an ideal human would look like that isn't based on a role model, um, doesn't require that epistemically. We've got a different basis, a, maybe a more objective, I would say, basis than just uh, a role model. But you can probably imagine how this contemporary version of virtue ethics is going to set up problems that are going to start looking like moral relativism because, you know, one culture's hero is another culture's villain. You know, different cultures have different um, role models that they look up to, and those role models may not be compatible with each other. So, um, <clears throat> as Velasquez puts it here, uh, under virtue theory, that moral judgments are informed by the character traits that are woven into the cultural fabric of a historical community. So that is also going to make it, make what is the right way to be, what's an ideal character to have, or an ideal personality uh, linked to contingent features of culture. Pardon me, culture. Oh no, hiccups. They're going to be linked to these contingent aspects of culture. Oh man. Um, the way that cultural relativism would have it. Come on, come on, body. Ah. Sorry about this, everyone. Oh, come on, body. It's still threatening, so I'm not going to talk. Whew. Okay. So, uh, not definitely, I wouldn't say that uh, Aristotle is going to have. Um, this risk of relativism built in because of how he's grounding what a virtuous person looks like. But if you're running more of these, one of these more contemporary derivatives of it, um, that really is looking at role models as the basis, um, based on intuition, really intuitional appeals, then there are deep concerns about relativism. And that brings up a general point that I wanted to mention. Um, this is not something that Velasquez throws into the discussion, but I wanted to add it. Um, I mentioned before that I'm not the biggest fan of intuitions as a source of moral argument or justification. Um, uh, consulting our conscience I don't think is always very reliable. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, for me, me, my skepticism, and actually this is a skepticism that Mill and Kant also kind of share about intuitions, why they didn't want to use intuitions. But the concern here is that it would be very easy for our moral intuitions to be infected with cultural bias, that we become acclimated and encultured to a set of values or a model of life um, that maybe we should be rethinking. Um, just personally, I, I know that a lot of you disagree with me about this. This has been one of the things I've been sort of 
commenting on occasionally in my feedback to you. Uh, or maybe it's sort of happening to, between the lines in some cases. But um, I don't think that uh, – I think a meritocracy is something that American culture heavily selects in favor of. And it's not always appropriate. I don't. I definitely. I think that there's um, that a meritocratic system has some contingent value to it, but I don't think of it as this like absolute universal theory of justice um, that it determines what's fair and appropriate in almost every case. Um, I think, uh, and so I. I would say, for Americans, um, rethinking meritocratic uh, moral intuitions is something that we really ought to do. I don't think that they're ultimately defensible. And, and morally justified, but they're really prevalent, and they're very deeply seated in us. So I could be wrong about that. It's possible. But it's definitely also, at least theoretically possible, that American culture's got that wrong. And if it has that wrong, it is still going to be spreading that kind of message and influencing people's thinking, regardless of whether it's right or wrong. That's the concern about bias, is that it exerts a kind of arbitrary influence on our beliefs, rather than it being based in argument. So I would say, as soon as we start wanting to defend, um, oh, a question, I'll get to that in one second. As soon as we want to start defending a moral theory on intuitive grounds, there are, again, all these kinds of concerns about moral relativism. Because if you came from a different culture that had different values, you'd probably have different moral intuitions. And so intuitions fighting one versus the other is not going to really uh, give us an argument to resolve the disagreement, ultimately. So um, Velasquez doesn't bring that up explicitly, but I definitely think it's a part of uh, what he's already talking about. Um, and it, it, I think it fits in really nicely with his argument. So I wanted to add that. So um, Hung Mei asks, uh, while operating businesses in other countries where women are regarded as subordinate to men and bribery is widely accepted, how should we deal with ethical or cultural issues? Um, Hung Mei, I can't answer that question for you right now. Only because that's the question that this entire discussion is going to be about this week. Um, I can give you my answers about this um, and how I think we should resolve this, these problems. Um, but I, I'm not going to get to that just yet. Um, and in fact, I may not get to it at all because uh, this class is not about Tim Linneman's philosophy. But I would be happy to kind of indicate some of my views about it. And I would absolutely love to discuss it with you more outside of class too, for sure. Um, but that the question that you're asking is is really the topic of this whole unit. Um, how do we deal with these issues? What would be the right way? Right now, <clears throat> Velasquez is inter is looking at the option that says just adopt the moral relativism perspective on this. Just say when in Rome do as the Romans do. You know that's their truth. You've got your own truth. That's their culture. They're right in their culture, and we're right in our culture. And if you we're going to go over there, do what they do. If they come over here, they should do how we do it. Um, and then we don't have any problems. That's kind of the, that, that's the relativist response to this. Um, but that may not be uh, an acceptable response. It may be a problematic response. And that's what Velasquez is going to argue. And I agree with him on that. I don't think relativism solves any of these problems, ultimately. Um, uh, but we can, we're going to have some other options to look at here as well. Um, good. Cool. All right. There, there's one other, um, uh, position that Velasquez brings up here that I, I think is, again, it's not straight up relativism, but it's pretty gosh darn close. And that's what he calls partiality. And this is one I see a lot too. Um, so he defines partiality as any element of a theory that allows for preferential status to interests of a particular community, like family, friends, tribe, etc., over universal moral obligations. So um, when it uh, patriotism doesn't have this problem on it, on itself, but when patriotism crosses the line into nationalism, now we got a problem. Um, that that would definitely be moving into this realm of partiality. Um, patriotism could be partial in this way, depending on how it was expressed, but Usually in the way we talk about these isms and define them, nationalism is really the one that um, is much more problematic here. But think about it uh, as like, um, oh, well, gosh, I don't want to keep making this political, but the America first thing, that's just too obvious of a, 
a cultural touchstone for nowadays for what's going on with this partiality sort of thing. Um, but actually, maybe in a more sympathetic light here, um, many of you have expressed to me that um, when you're thinking about some of these other moral obligations that pertain to, especially like whistleblowing or something, that you've been very impressed with how um, duties to you and your family might be more important than these broader concerns for morality that are more universal or to society at large. Um, and that also starts to move in the direction of moral relativism because it's sort of saying like we can we don't have to play by the same rules here and it's fine for me to have double standards about what's ethical treatment of others versus the ethical treatment of the us that I'm a part of. Um, so that, that also moves in the direction of relativism too. Okay, so like I mentioned earlier, relativism has lots of problems with it. Self-defeating, can't be wrong, no room for growth. There's basically um, uh, doesn't resolve issues of tolerance, all this kind of stuff. Those are like general big picture things. But um, Velasquez has a couple really specific arguments to bring up. Um, and the first one I really like. I, I think it, I think it's it's kind of one of those. Sometimes in philosophy you don't get knockdown arguments. This one feels like pretty much a knockdown argument to me. I could be wrong about that. I'm curious. Maybe if you think differently, let me know. Um, but uh, he says relativism can't work as a solution here because it it might help you. It might inform your choices if you're just a visitor to another country, right? If you're um, if it's a matter of operating here versus operating there. Uh, then, yeah, you could, you know, just switch gears, right? Switch your mode of operating to match the culture that you're engaging with. But it provides zero help, absolutely no help whatsoever, in coordinating efforts between people who come from different cultures. So if you're thinking about the multinational corporation, that's like, okay, we got people from this culture and people from this culture, but they're all in this one community, our company. And what happens in this branch is relevant for what happens in this branch. And we've got to coordinate those activities. We've got to have some policies here. Um, relativism offers nothing. It has no answer at all for how to solve those problems. Um, even just from a managerial perspective, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything for you. It doesn't answer the question about how to coordinate people in these cross-cultural contexts. Um, so that it, it's just a non-starter, as we might say in philosophy. It doesn't even get off the ground as a proposal um, because it doesn't address the problem at all. I think it's a pretty powerful argument, and I and I agree with Velasquez's concern here. <clears throat> the other one, though, that he talks about, and I really like his way of putting this. He says relativism substitutes arbitrariness for justification, and it's a may, that might be a little vague here, but <clears throat> the way that Velasquez is looking at this, in relativism, no reason is being given for the legitimacy of a set of values other than that people have them, that they're a part of the culture. And he talks about this as a kind of blind allegiance, since it blatantly ignores the possibility that a culture could have the wrong standards, that it could make mistakes on that. Um, there's always the, uh, the um, concern about overusing the Nazis as an example, but they, in this context, they are not a irrelevant counterexample. If you wanted to say that cultures could never do wrong, I mean, you'd have to, you'd have to say, you'd have to bite the bullet on saying the Nazis didn't do anything wrong for them. And that's just not, not satisfying. That, that's not a very palatable choice to make. Um, it does seem like cultures can get things wrong. Um, we seem to we I mean we've one of the most prominent issues of the 20th century is colonialism and ways in which uh, some cultures invaded other cultures and basically exploited them and that culture of imper of imperialism of colonialism uh, seems to be inappropriate um, it definitely there's a lot of concerns about it but relativism and anything that's kind of giving the authority of a culture to dictate terms of what is ethical and moral for that culture um, can't uh, can't criticize that kind of stuff. It would have to endorse it. And that doesn't seem right. It seems like cultures can make mistakes. They can take wrong turns. Um, any, and just think about how cultural reform ever happens. 
for anyone who's like fighting for a different a change in culture they could never be a relativist um and unless you wanted to say that change is never a good thing which also seems absurd uh you're gonna have to back off on relativism so i like this way of saying that it substitutes arbitrariness for justification um i actually think that velasquez is maybe in danger of violating that his own argument here later on in the paper but the one thing that he keeps wanting to sort of emphasize is how it's not rationally satisfactory to say this thing is right just because people believe it the fact that people believe something doesn't mean that it's right and to respect someone like uh yeah let me put this in a little a slightly different context um in my experience i've met many people yeah i'll, I'll tilt my hat for this one in my experience i've met a lot of people who are reluctant to judge um, people from other cultures or to say like I don't want to say you're doing anything wrong because they're worried that it's going to be disrespectful um, that it disrespects the other person's judgments but as I've talked about before about respect with the code of intellectual conduct I don't think criticism has to be disrespectful sometimes it's disrespectful the way we do it but the criticism itself is not inherently disrespectful um, and it would be a mistake to just sort of say the only way that I can respect you is by letting you have your way, right? That doesn't seem right. It seems like it is possible for us to talk to each other and say, look, I got some concerns about your perspective. Um, I've got these issues with it. What do you think about that? I don't think there's anything disrespectful about that. Um, so it's kind of misguided to say that in, for the sake of respecting each other, we have to avoid criticizing each other or to think that everyone is infallible in their judgments, that that's sort of what it means to respect people. Um, even for Kant, who's like the most, he puts respect for people at the top of the pyramid of moral moral issues. Like that's the that's the bedrock for everything else. Kant doesn't think that respecting people means thinking that they're always right. And in many ways, respecting them means giving them the dignity of being potentially wrong. So I think that that's a that's a pretty big issue here. For relativism in many ways um, it ignores the dignity that happens from saying people have good reasons now there's another way though that you could hesitate so I guess you keep it like this Another way you might hesitate on making a judgment of someone else uh, someone from a different culture has a different perspective than you to not just jump to the conclusion that they're wrong if you uh, assume that they might have some reasons for their perspective so rather than just being like, well, I don't like the looks of this. I think it's wrong. I'm going to criticize you for it. Okay, so that's maybe not super respectful. If you're uh, giving that criticism in a way that sort of like anticipates that they must ha not have any good reasons. But if we're going to talk about respecting people, say, from other cultures, as under the, the uh, assumption that they might have some good reasons for why they have the values that they do or why their culture is taking the direction that it has – then we're no longer in relativism territory anymore because it's not it's now saying that there are some universal principles some considerations rational considerations that would justify that opinion that perspective not just that they believe it so it's true for them the way that relativism does so i think i, I think velasquez is framing this up exactly in the right way that relativism does remove the possibility of rational discussion and that should be really concerning to us on the grounds of, a, of respect for people, a value on respect for them. So instead, uh, try to listen to people from other cultures that you're unfamiliar with. Try to understand their reasoning. But just because they have reasons doesn't mean those reasons are ultimately correct either. And this is why we have disagreements, because we have different reasons and different ideas about stuff. And, uh, and so we need to sort out which of those reasons sort of ends up holding the most water which ones hold the most weight um, and that's a tough tough discussion to have uh, and we can both possibly be wrong about it this is all going back if this sounds familiar it should it's coming from the code of intellectual conduct we talked about fallibility principle burden of proof principle all this good stuff so <clears throat> that's Velasquez on relativism and kind of a refresher about this whole thing um, I think this might be a good time to take a break before we go into the next part next half of Velasquez about absolutism um, but I did want to check in with everyone in, in the chat and see how this has gone so far 
um, have any questions been popping up or anything for discussion about relativism? So far, so good. What do you? Uh, I'm. I always like to. Ah, man, I, I. I think this one of my favorite things about this topic is that <clears throat> I think it has a lot of opportunity for people to share their experiences and thoughts and perspectives. Like, and so I, I am curious to uh, you know hear about reactions from students. We always usually have lively conversation when I'm doing this uh, in in camp on campus in person in in a classroom, um, and so online I'm I've I've complained about this enough times before, but. Uh, I am very curious to see if those of you in the chat have some reactions to all this. What you sort of think about it. Cool. Lecture is helpful. I'm, I'm happy to hear it. A lot of times this issue is something I think a lot of us have, we have feelings about. We're like, ooh, I, we definitely know that there's something there. But this is one of the things that philosophers can really provide as a service is to give an articulation to those feelings um, or those intuitions that we have. It's kind of a sensing that there's something going on uh, and help to frame, frame it up so that we can maybe – uh, have some more productive reflections about how to respond to it or how to make sense of it all. I kind of an, another kind of a thought just jumped into my head about this response to relativism um, that maybe I'll share. Um, I sometimes like to think about it this way: How would you want to be treated if you were in another country? Would you want people to just think that you're right just because you have different beliefs? Or would you want them to understand your reasons for why you have those values? Um, I think my my guess would be that the first kind of treatment would seem to be kind of pandering, uh, and not like people aren't really interested in understanding you by just sort of dismissing you as different, right? Um, and tolerating your existence, which is nice. It's better than being harassed or uh, oppressed for it, but. Um, there's sort of a lack of a deeper connection or respect, right? If they don't care to understand why, if they just sort of uh, treat you as something exotic, right? That they're like, oh yeah, that that crazy foreigner who's got their crazy views, you know? And you might be like, well, hey, I've got I've got some reasons here. Like maybe you should consider this idea too, kind of thing, um, rather than just being dismissed immediately. Hung Mei, you said respect. Uh, was there um, – what, what did you have in mind with that? Is it that you'd, you'd want to be treated with respect? So I guess the question I've got about this, and that's kind of where the two options were, is what does it mean to you to be respected? Like how would you know that you're being respected if you're a foreigner in a, in a different culture than the one that you come from? People should value your culture. Um, that might get us a little bit further along. I think I could still ask my same question of how would you want them to value your culture? And, and to, I'll, I'll help spell this out a little bit more. Like the two options I was presenting, one of them would be like they value your culture but as something kind of just exotic and different that they're like, oh, yeah, just that foreigner's got those weird values that are different from all the rest of us. 
versus valuing it in the sense of actually taking it seriously and thinking about trying to understand the reasons why you've got the cultural values that you do. Um, I My suspicion is that it's that second one that's what it really means to respect you or what it would, um, like in a more meaningful sense of respect or a more meaningful sense of valuing your culture. Um, that we can see like, here here's the grounds on which it's legitimate rather than that it's just some kind of arbitrary choice that you have made uh, rather you know like the, as if there's nothing backing it up or something is that how you feel or, or do you feel differently my my uh, prediction might not be correct <laughs> have to think about it well that's fine that's totally fair um, that's what philosophy is for um, well let's take a break um, and maybe you can think about it I'll, I'll check in again when we get back um, but I'll, we'll take a short break here and then uh, come back for the rest of the lecture okay we're getting back into it actually on the break I had a, a nice little conversation with Hong Mei and um, I think there might be uh, I think there might be opportunity for conversation with a lot of you out there on YouTube watching this later um, may, weren't around here to maybe talk with me about it tonight, but if you want to talk more with me, I'd love to. I mean, like I said, one of my favorite uh, things about this topic is that I think it really does um, fit into our lives in a very meaningful way. Um, if I, I know a bunch of people in the class are not American natives, um, so this might be really something that touches on your personal experience directly, but even if you are um, born and raised in America, I mean, America is the melting pot, and Dealing with cultural diversity is is a big part of what it means to live in America, and figuring out what is the right way to respond to that I think is worth philosophical reflection and discussion. Um, what we really mean by things like respect and honoring each other and respecting our cultures and traditions too, um, and where those lines are drawn. Hey, you know one thing that came up in my conversation with Hong Mei um, that I, I didn't want to share with everybody um, is that. In some of these cases, relativism may look like it's a totally fine option that doesn't that isn't subject to all these other complaints that Velasquez is bringing up, and that's these sort of cases where uh, we have cultural differences that are not really matters of like deep moral disagreement, but just maybe a matter of conventions about how we express certain messages, um, things like maybe uh, cultural festivals. Um, or the ways, like the way we might introduce ourselves to each other. I was using the example in our discussion about um, shaking hands versus the Japanese custom of bowing. I mean, if your flexibility on that is not really a problem, and accommodating all those sorts of cultural differences in, of convention shouldn't be anything that we would really worry about. I mean, there's no there's no concern about that. But it doesn't need to be because of relativism being right that we would say yeah those conventions don't matter it's probably only in those cases where we don't think that there's some bigger moral issue at stake that that kind of uh, responsiveness is seen as appropriate but that that kind of answer won't help with these stickier things where the cultural differences get to issues of deeper moral value and that's what Velasquez is really going to explore in this next option where he's talking about absolutism so let's let's get into that so he defines absolutism as the view that there's a set of universally valid moral standards that legitimately can be used to evaluate behaviors in all cultures. So there's there's basically some um, rules, some like universal rules, um, that tell us how to handle cases in a way that doesn't involve double standards. Um, this is why it, this definition of absolutism is why I thought. The difference is that there are differences between subjectivist and realist accounts, but the fact that they both agree that there are universal objective standards means that they're both going to be in this kind of category. So even views like Kant and Mill, who are saying there is some universal moral rules here, um, but they're sort of based on some kind of subjective factors, um, things that are subjective about humanity, 
is not really doesn't prevent anything about there being universal or, or um, objective moral truth. The other thing that I want to remind you about in this discussion is that having absolute, having taking the absolutist position doesn't mean that you're kind of like forcing everyone into the same box. It, it doesn't mean something like that. We especially talk about this with Kant. I don't know if you remember. Um, but if you want to universalize a rule, like a moral principle, that moral principle could be really sensitive to contingencies. So, for example, if we're looking at differences in practice between people from different countries, it's not just a matter of their cultures, but it also might be a matter of their circumstances. So, take the difference between developed countries and less developed countries. Um, what people sometimes refer to as third world. I don't quite like that term. Um, I think it sort of um, creates a lot of opportunities for misconception. But that just that difference of circumstance. Developed, not as developed. Industrialized, not, not industrialized. I mean, those circumstances are really different. And what works for one may not work for the other. That's going to be the big point that Warhane's going to make. But that doesn't mean that there aren't universal principles. We could just have universal principles that say, in this context, this would be the ideal thing. In this context, this would be the ideal thing. And we could still find a basis for why we're going to treat these different cases differently without saying something like moral relativism. So I just want to remind you that um, if absolutism has problems, which Velasquez is going to say it does, it doesn't have problems on the grounds that it's it's kind of doing this one size fits all thing that ignores differences. It can be very sensitive to differences and probably needs to be. To be able to have truly universal rules, you can't just treat cases alike that are morally different from each other. And there are lots of different potentially morally relevant circumstances that could change the outcome of what we think is appropriate or ideal. And we've talked about this a bunch of times throughout every single topic that we've been exploring actually. We've been trying to be sensitive to creating a model that really does work in accommodating all the varieties of circumstances that we might have to make decisions about. Um, whether that's from whistleblowing or from issues of uh, affirmative action or fiduciary duty or any of this stuff. Um, so, and, and the other thing I want to say about Velasco's criticism of absolutism um, is that he does not, he's not going to say that um, any absolute answer is wrong. He just wants to say that the particular absolutist theories that people have been advocating for in moral philosophy today are themselves subject to bias. That, and that's going to be his main game here. So he's going to look at three theories. He's going to look at human rights theories, he's going to look at utilitarianism, and he's going to look at theories of justice. And in, and in the details, he thinks they all invoke certain assumptions that are really tied to uh, Western beliefs and and individualistic cultures beliefs. So he thinks he's going to try to show that they're they're not really universal, that they're actually uh, parochially biased. Um, but he's not saying that any attempt would of an absolute theory theory would work this way. In fact, I think what sort of where where Velasquez does leave us at the end of the day is not this purely fatalistic conclusion, although it is kind of fatalistic, um, but what Velasquez is really encouraging us to do is to think a little bit more outside the box, to get creative. I don't think he's going to argue, he's definitely not going to argue for a relativistic answer. He is pretty adamantly opposed to anything in that direction. But I think what he's looking for is some kind of absolutist theory that does a better job of respecting how there's a real disagreement here between collectivist cultures and individualistic cultures. That That's the main continuum of cultural disagreement that he's being sensitive to. And there's probably there's probably some other ones we should add on that radar too. But that's the main one that he's targeting. So again, he's not criticizing all absolutists, any theoretical option that could come in that category. Instead, he's just going to be looking at these particular absolutist theories that have been offered. This will be relevant when we look at Arnold, because Arnold is going to actually try to show that there are some theories available, namely stuff that's built off of Kant, a human rights theory based off of Kant's arguments, that actually is universal. And this is another, so this is maybe a little bit more of my commentary on what Velasquez is going to be up to here. And maybe I'm jumping the gun on this, but I, I think this is a good framing thing for where we're going to go next. Remember I said earlier that Velasquez is worried that 
just because we believe something doesn't mean it's true. And I think that's the concern here about Western bias infiltrating moral philosophy. He's going to say, if the only reason why we find these theories persuasive is that we come from a Western culture that shares that perspective, then that would not be adequate. But what I, I wish that he maybe was a little bit more explicit about, and something that he would have to be more explicit about if he's going to say there's maybe some version of an absolutist theory that could work, is that we need to be sure to say whatever is going to be a universal standard, an absolutist theory, right, that has a universal valid moral standard, is not going to be something that everyone has to agree to. And he's actually, when I think about it, in the paper he is clear on that point, okay? He's clear that um, if we're going to try to defend an absolutist theory, it's not like it needs to be something that everyone agrees to. It just has to be based on an argument or have as a basis of justification something that doesn't prejudge or beg the question on one of these issues of cultural disagreement. So that, that's why I think the, the, the safest way to frame his criticism here is to say he believes, he, he's offering the suggestion that the only reason that we find human rights, utilitarianism, or theories of justice attractive within Western moral philosophers discussing this issue is because we come from a Western culture, so that we're, we're infected with this cultural bias. This is what Western culture says is good, so that's why we agree with the theory. Um, I don't think that, um, well, okay, I'll put it, I'll just put it this bluntly. I think that Velasco is, this is, this is my sort of evaluation of it. And again, maybe I'm jumping the gun, but I think it might be helpful as a framing device. Um, I think Velasco's sort of, he's like, ooh, I see the touch of Western culture here. I see a parallel with Western culture, so there's bias. Done. And that would be far too quick. I think if Velasquez was going to offer a really convincing argument that these absolutist theories are biased, he'd have to look at the underlying justification behind those assumptions. So, in other words, these values on individualism um, or versus collectivism, uh, some of these metaphysical ideas of personhood and stuff like that, um, they, they aren't just artifacts of Western bias. Uh, or Western culture, they have arguments behind them, and philosophers have argued for them explicitly many, many, many times. If those arguments are not convincing, then maybe we got a problem here. Um, but we'd have to look at those arguments, and Velasquez doesn't really do that. He doesn't dig into them. In the same way that I was saying um, before the break about what it would mean to respect someone from a different culture, would I was saying I think that means looking at the rationale behind their perspective and not just assuming that, oh, they're just coming from this culture or something like that. I think that's the same thing that Velasquez owes to Western philosophy as well. Um, that that's, that'd be um, the way to respect what these theories are offering too. Um, otherwise, we get into maybe the kind of everything is biased option that motivates things like relativism. And Velasquez is pretty clear that he doesn't want to go that way with it. So I think there's going to be more to this. We're going to get into that a little bit more because Arnold is going to specifically address that uh, challenge directly. In other words, Arnold's going to say, look, contrary to what Velasquez is arguing, I think human rights aren't, is not something that's just based on Western values. Um, and, and we can give a defense for it that invokes considerations that people could find persuasive regardless of what cultural background they come from. So this isn't just privileging one culture over another. The other thing I think that might be worth thinking about, and Arnold's going to bring this up too, is that um, maybe Velasquez is uh, exaggerating the cultural differences that exist between collectivist cultures and individualistic cultures. And maybe I should turn my hat again here. From conversations I've had with international students and, and just people across the planet as they've filtered into my life in a lot of different ways, not just through teaching, um, I've, I've sort of become more and more convinced of that, that uh, especially when it comes to Eastern versus Western philosophy, that there's um, th these two sides are not so black and white, um, and that there's an incredible amount of intellectual diversity that occurs within Western and Eastern traditions, um, and they can't just be all lumped up into the same bag. Um, you find uh, 
uh, collectivist leanings in Western culture, and you find individualistic leanings in Eastern cultures too. So I think, I think people from different. This is my stance on it. I think regardless of what cultural background you come from, you're in a position to be able to talk about these big philosophical debates. And um, the answers here don't necessarily require privileging Western philosophical approaches or something like that. So I, I think sometimes the differences can get exaggerated. Uh, but it is good to think about all the different theoretical options that are out there, and I very much appreciate Velasquez for putting that kind of stuff on our radar, thinking about what are the underlying assumptions that are behind the values that we find intuitively correct. We have to interrogate them that way if we're going to be able to give a defense to say, look, these things aren't biased, right? We, we would have to do that. So I think that's really appropriate too. Okay, maybe I need to write a paper about this. <laughs> um, but let's keep moving. So that's kind of the big picture of what Velasquez is going to be up to here. Let's take a look at what he says, though, in detail about these three different approaches. Okay, human rights. This is going to be a big option. Arnold's going to talk about it, like I just mentioned. I've, uh, I've put the UN Declaration of Human Rights as a supplemental document for this unit. It's not something that you're writing comments on or anything like that, but since Velasquez brings it up and Arnold's going to talk about it heavily, I thought you might want to look at it in full for yourself. Uh, I think it's definitely worth reflecting on. Um, this has been exactly the, the premier option that has been um, sort of offered in the, in the international community today as a way to try to find a universal valid set of moral standards that could be applied cross-culturally. Um, so uh, the, the way that Velasquez is going to analyze this, and again, we might take issue with his interpretation of human rights, but he thinks a lot of this is based on Western metaphysical concepts. First off, this individualistic conception of personhood. So in other words, that individual people are the things that have rights. And this, he thinks, comes from Western values of individualism. But there, there's kind of two, I, I think he splits apart these two assumptions, and I think it's good to do it. One is a metaphysical assumption, the other one is ethical. So the metaphysical one is just that um, the, the most salient or significant unit of measurement um, for talking about the meaning of a person is that person taken in isolation from society. So as an, as an individual in their own right to themselves. And that can be contrasted with this kind of collectivist um, perspective that sees the significance of the individual they're still we're still talking about the significance of the individual but only in the context of their place in the rest of their group um, the collective right the the community of people in society now like I mentioned I think sometimes these differences can be overblown Westerners are very concerned about community um, but maybe in a little different way. And, and I, I think there's some weird irony things here. Uh, maybe, I, uh, okay, another little quick tangent here. Um, take Facebook. This is one of my favorite examples. So at this point, things like social media are pretty strongly a part of American culture. And it can be looked at very individualistically. Someone's got a Facebook page where they're posting pictures and telling everyone about what they're doing in their life. A lot of times it's a lot of self-congratulatory sort of stuff. Um, here's my feelings, here's my thoughts today, here's what I'm doing, look how meaningful my life is, I, and there's some performative aspects to it. But that's what's sort of interesting, that this individualistic expression almost requires or necessitates a collective community to see them, to, to sort of experience that performance of individuality. And without that community to sort of acknowledge the individual's existence, it doesn't have as much meaning. I think that's really interesting. I think it shows that Western culture is maybe not as individualistic as we might pronounce that we are, but we are really concerned about um, even some some of these kind of Eastern cultural notions of like face saving, um, uh, of like image and how you're seen by others. I mean, Facebook looks a lot like that. It definitely has this kind of attention on me as an individual, but lurking in the background is a lot of collectivist notions, I think. So that's my little psychoanalysis of Facebook there. Um, but, but this is what uh, Velasquez is going for, that there, there still is different ways that we could think about what's significant about an individual person. Are we looking at them 
are we carving it up in the context of them to themselves or are we looking at it in the context of their role and place in society and then the ethical component is different that whatever is happening to the individual should take ethical priority over what's happening to how they're contributing to the community and that's another way that sometimes we do think about human rights um, so there's this kind of um, priority given to the concern for the individual regardless of what that's going to mean for social harmony um, regardless of what that's going to mean for like productivity or contribution to society um, we sort of uh, in the West we in an individualistic perspective we might um, downplay this role that you have in society and think yeah that matters but it's secondary to the concern about the individual for their own sake personal goals personal happiness things like that that it's okay for people to prioritize that be like you got to look out for yourself that kind of sentiment that you hear a lot in America um, and not just be a doormat for everybody else or have your life completely devoted to others but you've got to sort of protect the sacred space of yourself as an individual that might be in contrast with some notions from other cultures okay so Human rights has those kinds of uh, basic assumptions to it, this metaphysical concept and this normative concept, too, of priority. And uh, Velasco says collectivist cultures don't always share that. Um, the identity of a person might depend on the community, how, what their role is in that community, how they, how they are, are participating with something bigger than themselves, and that the goals and welfare of the community might overshadow appropriately the uh, individual goals. And that I should make my individual goals sort of secondary to the goals of the community that I'm a part of or society at large. Okay, so um, we'll talk more about human rights with Arnold, so I think I'll leave it at, at that. Utilitarianism, we're going to say the same sort of things. Uh, we're going to see the same sort of things according to Velasquez. Um, remember utilitarianism, the... The, w there is a lot of ways in which utilitarianism, I think, rightfully can be connected with collectivist mindsets, that we're thinking about the greater good, that you have to think about how does pursuing my own personal preferences maybe go against the preferences of other people. I need to be really sensitive to those around me. I think utilitarianism has a lot of collectivist elements to it. But Velasquez is going to say that at the end of the day, it still has this component about how the aggregate good the collective good is really built out of individual good added together. So it's the individual person who is the thing that's going to be happy or unhappy and that has preferences to be respected morally. Um, so that's a little different. I, I like this way that he puts it, that it the utilitarianism proceeds from an assumption or a belief about the independence of individual desires and maybe doesn't respect as much how the collectivist perspective that um, I should see my desires as being determined by the goals of the community. Now, as a little side note, I think actually utilitarianism moves very strongly in the collectivist direction. I think it really will. As soon as you start running the utilitarian calculus on your own preferences, if you've got choices to make about what to value, which is exactly this point of disagreement between individualistic and collectivist cultures. If I'm deciding, should I identify my preferences as just things about myself as a microcosm, or should I be thinking about them in the longer, in the sort of broader view of how does that interact with other people's preferences, I think utilitarianism is going to tell you that you ought to choose in favor of developing preferences that are compatible with the preferences of other people around you. Um, so that's going to really move it into a collectivist direction, I think. Um, so in many, in some ways we might actually say, uh, and this would be very interesting. I wonder what Velasquez would think about this, um, is maybe, maybe he's just misinterpreting the theory, but maybe his argument still holds in this way, that instead of thinking of utilitarianism as being infected with Western bias, is it infected with Eastern bias? Hmm. 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 Maybe. I mean, it was John Stuart Mill, a Westerner, a British person. Uh, who came up with the theory, but is he maybe privileging the kinds of values that come from collectivist cultures at the expense of individualistic cultures? Maybe a thought. Again, my two cents here was that you have to look at the arguments to really determine 
whether this has universal validity or not. And I think in many ways the arguments in favor of utilitarianism are things that um, a collectivist culture might be very sympathetic with as saying like, hey, yeah, our collectivist values aren't just arbitrary choices we made because we're collectivist cultures. It's, it's, it's justified, and these are the arguments. And so maybe these values are better than the individualistic ones uh, that predominate the Western world. Some food for thought. Okay, and then finally we've got these theories of justice. Um, so human rights, I say, uh, this is a side note I have in my lecture notes here, talk of human rights is still in line with notions of justice, and that's right. But um, Velasquez is talking about very particular um, ways of thinking about this that come from uh, theories like John Rawls's uh, theory of justice as fairness. So he's bringing in a, a more particular concern here with the, the section on justice that has to do with values on fairness and what counts as equal. Um, and I, I think he's got good things to say about this, but I, I just want to clarify some terms there about that. Um, we are going to talk a lot more about Rawls um, next week. Uh, I'm looking forward to that too. That's an awesome, awesome unit, and it's a nice one for us to kind of – it's going to be our last real strong push in the class, and it's going to be probably the most difficult reading that we've got, but very compelling stuff. I think in some ways um, Velasquez is not giving Rawls a full shot here. It's not the most charitable presentation, but – We'll see what you think when we get to Rawls and you read them for yourself. But what? Um, so I'm not going to go and give the whole Rawls theory right now. But let's just let's just focus on what Velasquez is commenting on about fairness itself. So we'll we'll talk about Rawls later. But when it comes to fairness, of of setting up some kind of theory of justice with rules, moral rules that we want to apply universally, that are based on this value of fairness and egalitarianism. Um, of what would be equal, uh, let's look at where there are some cultural differences. Um, one of them would be to say, well, what's fair is to give people opportunities or social benefits, um, these kind of benefits, and well, we're in the we're in the world here of benefits and burdens of social cooperation. Like, how does society pass out benefits and burdens? And uh, one way we could think about a pattern of what would be a fair way to do that would be to say that people receive from from these benefits in accordance with what they contribute. So basically, the more that you're shouldering a, as a burden, the more benefit you should receive. Um, this is really the meritocratic kind of idea that I was mentioning at the beginning of the lecture. Um, that comes from individualistic cultures predominantly. Um, that basically what you individually put in should determine what you're going to get out. If you put in more, if you put more effort in, if you're more skilled, um, then you should receive more of the benefit than people who don't put in as much or who are not as efficient or qualified or et cetera, et cetera. And I like the way that Velasquez frames this as saying that this is going to result in a society that's going to magnify the distinctions between people. So people already start with these differences, but if we're now going to hand out rewards and burdens sort of uh, on, based on those differences, then that's going to make those differences even greater. And that's what you often see in individualistic cultures. But in collectivist cultures, the idea of fairness here would be about receiving equal shares. And this has a tendency to ignore the differences between people. So um, in a collectivist culture, there can be a lot of like sharing that sort of happens this way where the group is working together, right? And individual people in that group, some might be able to contribute more, some less, or in different ways. But it's kind of the overall product that we care about. And then it's the overall benefit that everyone gets to enjoy. So it's it's really like thinking about it like um, in some ways like everyone in your community is all on the same team. And everyone deserves to be respected um, for participating in that. Um, the group I – mean, collectivist cultures and talking about like these group projects and goals that Velasquez is contrasting with individualistic goals again sometimes I think we can maybe try to exaggerate this too much like uh, I think many Western commentator commentators have been guilty of a kind of prejudice against collectivist cultures by by misinterpreting them in a not very charitable way as if people are just slaves to society or something like that in my experience in my experience studying, Eastern cultures and collectivist cultures and their philosophies, it's not so much like um, we're we're going to be um, treating a person 
as really just the slave of everything, but it's that society is really working for everyone's benefit, um, regardless of what they're able to contribute or not. Um, so in this kind of notion of fairness, it would be like, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be right for me to put my benefit above the benefit of everyone else in society. That's the thing that wouldn't be fair. Um, I don't know if any of you took a look at this. Uh, at the very beginning of the quarter, in the first introductory module, I had a um, little uh, selection from M. Yarda Sen. I might have mentioned it in one of the video lectures about this like flute example with these kids and like figuring out who should be playing with the flute kind of thing. And they all made a different, these kids all make a different moral claim of saying like, this is what would be fair. This is what would be just. And when we throw around notions of fairness, we got to be careful to be, mm. oh, the hiccups are back. Woo. Okay. Uh, we got to be careful that we're not um, insensitive to how different people hear different things when they're hearing the word fairness. And I'm not advocating for cultural relativism here. I'm just saying we need to recognize that there's we need to define our terms properly um, and there is a potential disagreement about this so just saying oh that's unfair boom QED argument over we need to be like okay what notion of fairness do you have in mind why are these other notions of fairness not the one we should be using and there's arguments to be made for meritocracies um, or for one of these different notions I mean I've been trying to kind of flesh out the rationale here behind the, the what Velasquez is labeling as individualistic versus collectivist sense, uh, senses of fairness. Um, but that's something to take seriously. Velasquez, I think, is worried that Western moral theories aren't taking that seriously. Um, that their notions of justice as fairness isn't recognizing that there is this philosophical disagreement between these two perspectives that just happens to be embodied in these different cultural backgrounds. Okay. Um, and then finally, there's this notion about uh, equality, so um, uh, the, and, and about discrimination. This is another thing that can differ from culture to cultures. Um, in a lot of Western societies, we would say something like a caste system is immoral. Um, to have people having sort of a role that they need to play in society and they need to stay in their lane and do their part and not try to elevate their status or move around that they have responsibilities and obligations that pertain to their place in society that we would think of that is wrong and unjust um, and then in these other cultures you do have a embracing of hierarchy um, probably one of the most notable philosophical examples of this I don't know how many of you are familiar with, with this uh, idea um, but the Eastern philosophy of Confucianism uh, has a kind of model for society that puts at the top sort of a value on harmony and it advocates for a hierarchical structure in society um, to promote that harmony that people need to stay in their place and do their job and they have specific obligations and responsibilities at that place and it is not uh, ultimately desirable to try to actually be in these higher rungs versus the lower rungs that um, what is of meaning is to contribute in the way that you can to the overall system working in the best possible way in a harmonious sort of way definitely Confucius is not thinking that people at the top need to be just like pursuing their own benefit this isn't a power structure sort of thing we can't use some of these Western models for that um, this isn't like a chain of command where the people at the top get to receive the most benefit the way that Confucius sets it up, this is actually one of the things I was explicitly had in mind a second ago when I said that collectivist cultures are not ignoring individual people. Confucius mentions how if you're at one of these higher positions, like if you're the ruler, for example, um, the highest possible position, then all of your decisions need to be made not in terms of personal benefit, but in terms of benefiting everyone else in society with the power that you're given to be on the top of this hierarchical pyramid comes the responsibility and moral obligation to make sure that you're prioritizing what's good for everybody else because if you don't do that then this harmonious structure is going to collapse in some ways and i think velasquez would hate this i would say confucian confucianism is a really 
it's it's on a very similar track to notions of social contract theory of justice which is exactly what Rawls has in mind so maybe we can talk about that more when we get to Rawls I'm not gonna be talking about Eastern philosophy very specifically but if you're still thinking about that if you're curious about this thread that I just opened up maybe bring it back or have a conversation with me about it I think there's some really interesting tangents that go on there okay um, I kind of want to well um, Hong Mei, you're the only one in, in the uh, chat tonight. How's this going so far? Uh, you'll be my canary in the coal mine tonight. Uh, is, do you have any questions about what I'm throwing down? Or anything you want to contribute to this discussion? Feel free to use your microphone if you're comfortable being on the recording. Okay, no questions? Okay. Are you familiar with Confucian philosophy? No. Um, are some of the things that I'm saying uh, sounding familiar to you about uh, collectivist culture? Like I mentioned, I, I think there's ways in which Westerners can misunderstand it, and I don't want to misunderstand it either. I hope I'm giving a uh, fair and accurate and charitable presentation of the view. Was that nope as in I'm not doing that or? Oh, maybe I lost her. Okay, well feel free to free to jump in if you if you want to about it. Um I'll keep going with the, the lecture here. Um, all right, there's, there's this last section that um, Velasco, actually, oh, I wanted to do this a little earlier tonight. Um, so, uh, okay, code word tonight um, will be, we've got this, you know, I'm a big fan of board games. Um, my partner found this board games for two-year-olds and it's, uh, it's called Bunny Bedtime. So that'll be our code word tonight. It's a really silly game. It's got almost no game to it at all. But um, it's a good first step, I guess, for getting my little one into the board game culture. So bunny bedtime is the code word for tonight. All right. <laughs> all right, so there, there is this last little section from um, Velasquez about a sort of hybrid option here that's trying to combine relativism and absolutism. I was kind of mentioning something that might have sounded a little bit like a hybrid uh, a while back when I mentioned that there are some cultural conventions that we might think, eh, it's no big deal whether you do it one way or the other, like the shaking hands versus bowing kind of thing. So it might be like okay to be a relativist about that, but then maybe an absolutist about other things. But I was trying to say there that that's not really being a relativist. Um, that that would be kind of like to say, well, hey, either one of these things is morally permissible, so it, it doesn't actually matter one way or the other to do it. That's actually to make an absolutist moral claim. To say that between these two options, there isn't anything of moral concern um, is to say something pretty definitive on a universal scale. Um, making universal moral claims is not always a matter of saying this is a moral obligation. It might also be to say that there isn't an obligation against this, right? Um, it's not like here's a moral concern, but it's also something to say here's not a moral concern. Like whether you wear mismatched socks or not doesn't really matter, right? It's not a morally relevant issue. That also is an absolutist claim, so I don't think that fits. Instead, this, this, um, this Frankenstein, what I'm calling this Frankenstein hybrid, is trying to say that there are some universal moral issues that actually absolutely have to be respected. Probably something about basic human rights. Um, this Donaldson and Dunphy suggestion is thinking about sort of some basic aspects of a social contract that would put us into obligation with each other in society. Um, but then 
they don't want this they don't want absolutism all the way down um they, these are only for some like absolute big picture fences on um what we can't uh, what are sort of the limits of moral action, but then within the boundaries of that, then it's kind of this do whatever you want based on local norms. Um, I don't want to talk a whole ton about this, but I like something that um, Velasquez says about this that I think is very useful in general and maybe a good word of warning um, for your paper project because uh, I found a lot of students are uh, attracted to hybrid or pluralistic models um, when they're working on their papers to resolve problems. I mean, Velasquez's complaint sort of comes down to this, that if you want to take two theories and smash them together, um, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, okay, how do you get them to fit? So it'd be one big thing to figure out where are you going to draw the line here between what's absolute versus what is going to be treated relativistically. That's a big question. Um, sometimes when you're putting two competing theories together, you're trying to have the best of both worlds. Um, it, getting those two good things to fit together and not contradict each other could require a lot of work. And you don't want to do it in a kind of ad hoc way. And that's why I mentioned Frankenstein monster, right? That these things don't dovetail really nicely together. Instead, they're kind of, yeah, there's some rough edges there about in the gray area where they meet. Um, they may not fit together very nicely. But the other concern is that in trying to get at the best of both worlds, you might also be inheriting the worst of both worlds. In other words, if the attractiveness of a hybrid or pluralistic model is that you can get the advantages that each of those theories has individually, you also are inheriting all of the argumentative baggage that they have individually too. So Velasquez has been trying to say, look, there's argumentative baggage for these very particular versions of absolutist theories that are on the table, human rights, utilitarianism, theory of justice. And there's a lot of baggage here for relativism as well. And the suggestion by Donaldson and Dunphy doesn't address any of those concerns. It doesn't, um, it's it still, it, the, when it comes to the hypernorms, the absolute universal values, he's still worried about parochial Western bias creeping in there, cultural bias being a part of that. And uh, when it comes to the relativistic part, it still looks arbitrary. Um, why should in in the space where we where we've got choices to make that aren't dictated by the hyper norms, why should we choose in favor of existing moral convention? Why not some new option? Why not do things differently? Why not reform our culture in some sort of way? Um, there's still no argument that's really being given for why we should have some preference for um, the the way we've been doing it. There's actually a whole fallacy around that. It's called the appeal to tradition. It's and the the fallacy says it's a bad argument if you say if, if your only reason for thinking we should believe or do something is because that's how we've done it in the past and that's that's another way of kind of putting Velasquez's concern about relativistic appeals why do we need to give all this authority to existing convention and practice if there if we should respect tradition it should be because of independent reasons and arguments. And that's why I think that, that's what Velasquez says. And that's why I think he's leaning more to some kind of absolutist solution to the problem he's made here. He doesn't give us that answer in this paper, but I think that's his speculations about where to go next, would be to try to come up with something new. In a, kind of as a transition here into Warhain, and I'm not gonna dive deep into Warhain here because we're already at an hour and 45 minutes on this lecture, but I, I, I think I kind of want to get a bridge going a little bit. Warhain's going to argue for something similar. Um, I, I think Warhain's going to be a good bridge from Velasquez's sort of pessimism or philosophical fatalism to something that's more positive. Um, so Warhain's going to say, yeah, there's some problems here about how we think about um, Western models of capitalism being applied into other cultural contexts, but is also sort of thinking at the end of the day to like, like kind of let the cat out of the bag here at the very end of, of Warhain's paper. Where Patricia Warhain's going to say um, that there's going to be a kind of change here, that in looking, she's kind of open to how there might be some relevance of some of these Western models to other cultures, that there, the other cultures might stand to benefit from importing some of these things about how Western societies function. But there's also other things about the Western models that aren't gonna work at all. 
and she thinks that when you bring these Western models into non-Western contexts, that actually they're going to maybe give us some insight about how the Western model ought to change too. She sort of she talks about this creative destruction, that there's kind of going to be a dialogue here, and there might be some ways in which um, seeing the situations of what's going to work and what's not going to work in other countries might teach us about ways that we can make capitalism work better for us. And that's very interesting. Um, I, I always get some students who um, initially react to Warhane as being sort of anti-capitalist, and I don't think she's that at all. Um, I think she's actually pretty clear about how she isn't. Um, there might be room for that, don't get me wrong, and an evalu a critical evaluation of capitalism might be very appropriate. Uh, but Warhain is thinking about a critical evaluation of capitalism, not as saying capitalism is fundamentally misguided, but that there might be some things here that need to be fixed, um, and that it isn't quite as universal as a good thing as we might think it is. That uh, we're going to have to adapt it uh, and be open to rethinking capitalism in maybe some pretty big ways in order for it to avoid other kinds of moral disasters. Um, so that's going to be kind of where Warhane's going to go with this. Um, but before uh, before I, I get any further into Warhane, uh, Hong Mei, uh, how are things going with uh, Velasquez? And do you do you have any kind of leftover questions about anything that was happening in in Velasquez? You still with me? No questions? Okay, cool. Um, I think I think it'll be good for uh, an ambition for the rest of this lecture. Um, I'm not going to try to do a whole lot of Warhane's big picture project, but I want to do a little bit of the setup. Um, Warhane uh, spends some time just discussing what she means by a model, and I think I think if we just talk about that, that'll put us in a good position for Thursday. Uh, we'll we'll finish up Warhane and also do uh, Ar uh, Arnold. Um, so we'll kind of be splitting the three readings between these two installments this week. Um, I think this is something worth not taking for granted and kind of talking over a little bit more. I, actually, this whole notion of a model I think is super cool. Uh, it's been very – it's been one of those uh, – personally for me, it's been one of these little bits of uh, theoretical technology that seems so useful in so many different debates and, and philosophical puzzles. Uh, so uh, that just a personal testimonial. Um, the fact that, that Warhane's talking about models is one of the big reasons I wanted to throw this into the reading list. Uh, I think it's really powerful. And you might uh, think about this too. Uh, you, you might experience it that way as well, that this is kind of an enlightening way to think about things. So, And, and there have been some philosophers who – I mentioned Nelson Goodman here in my lecture notes. Uh, Goodman makes this into like the basis of his entire uh, philosophical theory. Um, but here's, here's the idea. Um, a model is – a really dynamic type of mental representation. And, and so this is the quote from, from uh, Warhain. She says, a model is a mental representation, a cognitive frame, or a mental picture of a person's experiences. They're representations that model the stimuli or data with which that person's interacting in their life. And these are frameworks which set up parameters through which experience or a certain set of experiences is organized or filtered. Okay, I think we can actually be a little bit more clear about what we mean by this. Um, I've lectured on this kind of theoretical concept many times before, and I think I can actually help Warhane out here a little bit in making this really come across. So, but there's a reason why she chose mental representation as the, her opening description. Um, mental representation is, is kind of the preferred term for mental states in cognitive, uh, in cognitive science today, which is actually one of my areas of specialization. So mental representations are really diverse. When you have a perception or a memory or a dream or you're adding numbers or thinking about an idea, these are all mental representations. They're all states of consciousness that represent some meaning in some way or another. 
Um, and some of them are really specific, like um, the sentence I'm about to say right now, uh, or this cup, my like perception of this cup, very particular thing, right? But models are a much more robust mental representation. Um, I, in, in some of the work I've done with Kant, I like this term um, of a global representation. Uh, so if I've got all these different thoughts in my head, like different memories and perceptions and things like that, there are like files in a filing cabinet. I also have one piece of paper, if you will, that's kind of like this map that I put on the wall that references all of the other files that I've got in my file cabinets and sort of puts them together in one big picture. It's like my theory of everything. And I'm continually updating this thing. Every day I have new experiences, I have new thoughts, and I put them into this global representation. A model, as, as Warhane's using it, is starting to get closer to that idea of a global representation. Now, it might not be super global like everything, but at these sort of bigger, more abstract levels, I've got these more robust mental representations, these thoughts, which sort of integrate a whole lot of other ones. And their job, they're, they're functionally robust, too. They have two main functions. Um, oh, oh, before I get into the functions, though, some other words that I think are good words for what we mean by model would be things like paradigm or worldview or, um, gosh, there's a whole bunch of good ones here. Um, an ideology could be all right, too. Um, I, re I really like paradigm and worldview. Those ones are really good. Nelson Goodman likes the word worlds. He just calls them worlds. Um, and I can have worlds for all sorts of different aspects of life. Um, but, but these, they're, I like the word like worldview or paradigm because it's like, it definitely in, insinuates a, a bigger sort of perspective here of putting a lot of things together. So um, the, these objects have two main functions that they serve for us. There's a reason why we're drawn to them. Even if you're not a professional philosopher or something like that, or you're a philosophy major, you're using, you're doing this kind of theoretical stuff in the background all the time when you're when you're having any experience in life. You're you're kind of putting it together because you've got two things you need to do, and this is what models do for us. They organize our experiences. They help us make sense of our experiences. Think about like in, in the course of your day, you're confronted with new experiences and you need to fit them in somehow with what you know about things generally. It's not like every time you have an experience, you're like, oh, I'm in a totally new world. I, I have no assumptions about what's going on here. I'm just like a child figuring everything out for the first time. Um, I think I actually think that you can replicate getting into that state again with certain types of hallucinogenic uh, drugs, uh, certain dissociatives can put you in that kind of mindset. But we don't really operate this way. And even if you're under, like, if you're tripping on acid or taking magic mushrooms or something like that, um, you're still working at trying to piece it together. You just don't have all the other resources of the rest of your life to, like, call on to put it together all the, or maybe you don't have all those things at ready access the way you normally are used to when you're in a sober state of mind. Um, but this is what they do. models do for us, is they organize our experiences. They were like, each episode that happens to me is not some one-off case that has no connection or relation to anything else. I think about things that I've experienced before that are related to this, that might inform it or help me understand it in some sort of way. So that's the first thing. And that's what, um, uh, that's what Warhain means by talking about how they uh, organize or filter our experiences. They're, they're a framework that l lets us hang all these individual experiences onto some kind of map. So that's one thing. The second function that they serve, though, is that they give guidance for how we're going to respond to any particular situation. So kind of think about it like every time something new is happening to me, I'm in a new experiential moment in life, I have two things I got to do figure out what the hell is going on and what am I going to do about it. And a model is the thing I lean on to help me do that work that helps inform why I'm going to take this choice instead of this choice. So when you're thinking you're in a new situation, you're like, you know what, this is, I've been in this situation before. I know what happened last time. I'm not going to make the same mistake twice or this worked last time, so I'm going to try it again. You're using a model. You've got a model for what's going to work and what isn't going to work. Um, it's a system. 
and you're updating it and they can be dynamic they can change you can grow um, but they also sort of can lock you into a certain way of thinking too you can become attached to these models and maybe you don't think as much outside the box when you're leaning on them all the time and that's what Warhane's really going to be arguing for is that we need to update the models that we have um, they're useful they're functional and they might be able to be improved as well and she thinks of capitalism and the paradigm of free market free enterprise free market capitalism as being one of these kinds of models it helps it gives us a perspective from which to interpret what's going on in a situation and to figure out what would be ideal like what should we do about it how could we make things work better okay so uh, think of models as having a descriptive component and a normative component the descriptive part is like, how am I going to interpret and understand and see what's significant or meaningful about this situation? Like, what's going on? What jumps out at you? And then the normative component is, what is ideal? What would be the right way to respond? Um, what are the values that sort of motivate uh, what to do? So a model is sort of integrating values and beliefs together, okay, in one theory. Um, I say in my lecture notes here, you can think about them like an employee handbook, except instead of a set of guidelines for how to do just a particular job they're like guidelines for how to live period like how to understand everything in life um, or maybe a bigger sector of life okay so um, that's my little shtick on models uh, I hope that's enlightening I hope that helps flesh out what we're is going for here and what she means by talking about free enterprise as a model as a kind of paradigm uh, or as like an ideology or a worldview from which you look at things um, if any of you have taken economics, uh, some economics classes, and you've seen uh, capitalist econ economic modeling, uh, this might look pretty familiar because uh, modern economists, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if your economics class is doing it right, in my opinion, they would be giving you some traditional theories about how to understand systems in the economy, but also the kind of contemporary criticisms of those classical models uh, that have happened more recently. And a lot of those criticisms have been rethinking the basic assumptions that are behind those classical models and saying, is that really right? Is that the best way to make sense of what's going on in life in all these diverse circumstances? And, and that's what Werhan is going to be going with here, too. Okay, uh, I hope that made sense. Uh, how did it go for you, uh, Hong Mei? Do you have any questions about this idea of models that Werhan is presenting? No? Okay, I guess I did a good job explaining it. I hope so, but I don't want to make any assumptions. Cool, awesome. All right, well, um, I guess we'll sign off for tonight. I gave you the code word. Uh, again, be in touch with me about papers. Um, there were some of you, uh, well, there was one, one person over the weekend that I was trying to connect with and we never got connected. You know who you are. Um, I'm really sorry that that didn't happen. I'm sorry my sickness kind of threw a monkey wrench and everything. Um, a bunch of you I've been able to find times to meet uh, or to talk on the phone. Um, but let me know. I, I We're getting down to it. Like I said, I, I think you really want to have most of your brainstorming worked out by the end of this week. Um, and give yourself a full week to write the paper, uh, write a draft of it and edit it up and, and make some adjustments along the way once you're really starting to put pen to paper and fingers to keys and that sort of thing. But um, I, if you've already talked to me, feel free to keep talking to me. Um, I'm going to try to be as available as I possibly can this week and make just about anything work out, uh, no matter how late it is or whatever. Um, so let me know how I can help. Um, have a good night, Hung Mei. I'll see you. Thanks again for showing up, and see you all you out there. Good luck with the papers. I hope you're enjoying them. I, I really hope that. If you're not enjoying it, let's talk about it, because I think there's a there's almost always a path where it can become enjoyable. I know it's challenging, and it's a lot of work, um, but I, I hope that it's rewarding work. And if it's not, I want to I wanna find some way to work with you about it where we can make it something that you think is not a waste of your time, uh, and not just a matter of, of getting a grade or something. But is is actually interesting. Okay. So long.